Before I get started on this week's video, in the 90s it was either Sega or Nintendo, but the ultimate thing was Street Fighter or Mortal Kombat. Now I was Mortal Kombat and I want to know, what were you? Were you Mortal Kombat or were you Street Fighter? Let me know in the comments below while we crack on with today's video. Mortal Kombat was released in 1995 as an American fantasy martial arts action film and it was directed by Paul Anderson. The plot of the film tells the story of Liu Kang, Johnny Cage and Sonya Blade as they join the rest of Earth's forces in a tournament to try and save the world from the outworld forces who have won nine and they need this tenth victory to conquer Earth so they have to work together to win and save the Earth. When the film was released, it got a lot of praise for its action and closeness to the story, but there was a lot of criticism, so overall it was classed as mixed. But what I'm doing today is I'm going to be talking about 10 things that are majorly wrong with Mortal Kombat. Dusty! Number 10. Lack of blood. Let's face it, people only got Mortal Kombat for one reason only, and that was the blood and the gore. Let's face it, we all love doing those fatalities where you pull your opponent's head off and their spine still attached. Sticking your fist into someone's chest and pulling their heart out. That's what we all loved about this game. It was so controversial. This is why we have ratings on video games nowadays and it's all thanks to this game. So, you would expect a live action version to have lots of blood and gore. Nope, not one. I mean, granted, there was someone who exploded through uh, being frozen and then smashed, but no blood, no gore, no <laughs> anywhere. It was missing the main selling point of this game, and you missed it in this film. That's a bit disappointing, really. Number nine, recruitment. Earth needs some warriors to fight the forces of Outworld. So who gets the responsibility to recruit these fantastic warriors? Well, you would assume it was Raiden, the Earth, the Earth Realm's protector. But no, he doesn't. In fact, Shang Tsung actually does the recruitment, and he's in charge of the Outworld forces. So you would also, going by that rule, you'd think he'd re recruit weak, fat people like me, who would lose to guarantee your victory, and you can conquer Earth. But no, he actually recruits people that could potentially defeat him. It didn't really make much sense why Shang Tsung was doing the recruitment, especially as throughout the film Ryder was guiding them and helping them, but he didn't recruit them. Why not? Number eight, gunshots. This is quite an interesting, bizarre one, really. So, near the beginning of the film, they're in a nightclub in Hong Kong. And Sonya Blade's chasing down this henchman who comes running out, lets off a shot into the crowd, she fires back, hits him square on the chest, turns out he's got body armour on so he's alive. Dusty! But all the party goes are still dancing, even though one of the shots went off into the crowd. Um, does this thing happen often in Hong Kong that nobody batters an eyelid when there's a gunshot going off? In the UK, if a gunshot went off, everyone would be running for the hills, and in most American nightclubs, People will be running away, but in Hong Kong? No, do they keep on dancing? Is this a real representation? Oh, is it just someone just couldn't be bothered to actually tell the crowd, the extras, that they're supposed to be running away? Number seven, missing food. When they've gotten to the island, Shang Tsung puts on this amazing, beautiful feast for everyone to enjoy before the tournament starts and ultimately they're all going to die. But there's all this food that looks Gorgeous, and I just keep doing videos about food, it makes me hungry. But just as a demonstration, he puts on an exposition fight between Sub Zero and a random nobody. So all his guards come in, they wipe all the food off the tables, move the tables out of the way, they get ready to fight. So they fight where all the food was, which has miraculously disappeared. Where the hell has all that food gone? Also, what a waste of food, but. Well, I didn't see anyone clear up, it was just gone. Number six, CGI effects. So around about the time the films come out is when CGI started being used more and more. But the problem is it didn't actually look that good. It still looked very computerish, very jagged and rough and appalling. And this film is no exception. 
a lot of the CGI effects are really bad. Really bad. Look at Reptile. Look at the zooming in effects. They're just appalling. And unfortunately, it was appalling back then, so you can imagine what it looks like in today's age. It's not aged well at all. Number five, Liu Kang V. Yeah, I think the title of this section's got it spot on. So the first fight of the tournament is Liu Kang versus... Anybody? Dusty. Can anybody help me? No, that's the point. He's fighting a nobody. Nobody whatsoever. At least put in a Takata Warrior, because you were using Mortal Kombat 1 and 2, and 2 introduced the Takata Warriors with Baraka. Could we not have one of those people fighting? At least it would have made it a bit more sense and a bit more relevant, but we had a nobody, and it didn't really... That, out of all the fights, you didn't really care about that one at all. Number four. Your soul is mine. Yeah, I've really got to stop doing these uh, silly voices, but hey... I'll give it a try. But the point about Shang Tsung's soul taking doesn't really flow. I mean, he does it three times in the film. The first time is to Liu Kang's brother, and when he takes his soul, his face just dissolves into a skeleton first, and that was how he took his soul. Then the second time he took someone's soul was during Liu Kang's fights with the aforementioned, we don't know who the hell it is, where he goes up to him, puts his hand on his chest, and sucks the soul through his hand. Nothing like a change with his face this time. And then the third time he did it was when Art lost against Goro. It went through his eyes. There was no consistency with Shang Tsung's soul taking at all. Didn't really make sense. Do one, keep that all the way through, would have been fine, but you changed it every single time. Number three, where's Johnny? So as we're approaching the climax of the film, Liu Kang and Johnny Cage are going to Outworld to try and rescue Sonya Blade from the clutches of Shang Tsung. And on the way there, Liu Kang realises they're being followed by Reptile. Dusty! So Liu Kang grabs Reptile, gets thrown into a building, and have a fight while Johnny Cage was outside. Dusty! Why didn't Johnny Cage try and help at all? He's like, just stayed outside and let Liu Kang have this fight all on his own. I mean, I know starting off he was a bit of a selfish jerk, but by now he, the selfishness has gone a bit, it's died down. You could have had a brilliant, and this would have tied in with the game, a brilliant tag team fight, 2v1. Liu Kang and Johnny Cage versus Reptile, or have Johnny Cage versus Reptile. But it didn't really, yeah. What happened to Johnny? Number two, Liu Kang fighting. Yeah. One thing that bothered me about this film is the amount of fights that Liu Kang actually had throughout this film. He had that Nobody, he had Sub-Zero, Katana, Reptile and Shang Tsung. Five fights. By comparison, Sonya Blade had Kano and Johnny Cage also had Scorpion and Goro. Three. So between those two they had three fights and Liu Kang had five. It wasn't really balanced. This tallies on what I said about the part that Liu Kang fought Reptile while Johnny Cage disappeared. Why couldn't Johnny Cage be involved in that? It was very towards Liu Kang instead of being all of them. Number one, flawless victory. In this film, they used the term flawless victory a few too many times, especially when it wasn't a flawless victory. Now, any fans of the games will know a flawless victory is when you beat your opponent so well they don't get a single offensive move in on you at all and you finish the round with 100%. Tasty! This film only happens twice. Now, the first one was Sub-Zero versus the Random Guard. That was a flawless victory. And they actually give that credit as a flawless victory. The other one was actually Johnny Cage versus Goro, which is impressive but he didn't get the recognition of a flawless victory. Has anyone ever managed to beat Goro as a flawless victory? I mean, I always had about a smidgen of health left. Goro was impossible to beat, but Johnny Cage had a flawless victory. Look at it, not a single hit. The final fight between Liu Kang and Shang Tsung, Shang Tsung got a lot of fight hits in. That was not a flawless victory, yet you said flawless victory in that. Final thought. So what can I say about Mortal Kombat the movie? 
Well, first of all, it's a great movie. And one of the reasons what makes it great is they actually took the story from the game and transferred it over to the film. The main concept is from the first game, the ending, they sort of squeezed the whole of the second game as the ending. But that's worked. It worked because you've actually kept what we loved about the game. This is why Paul Anderson has the reputation of, let, we're making a video game film, let's call Paul Anderson. Because he was the first person to actually successfully adapt a video game into a film. Less said about the Resident Evil series, the better, but, and we've also got Monster Hunter coming out soon as well. But what makes this film great? Well, the fight sequences are brilliant. It was violent and brilliant and done in a PG style as well. So it was open to everyone. Yes, I've mentioned that the lack of gore was a bit off-putting and I maintain that, but it still kept that violence and that martial arts brilliantly. Justy. The casting was perfect. I mean, Raiden playing by Christopher Lambert was a stroke of genius. I mean, they wanted Sean Connery, rest in peace, but he just turned it down because he wanted to play golf. That man is a legend. But they got Christopher Lambert, and to be fair, I think they've made the best choice having Christopher Lambert as well. It was just fantastic. And one of the best things that really gets this film going is that soundtrack. If you've never heard the Mortal Kombat soundtrack, go and listen to it. It is brilliant. It's one of the best electro dance musics you've ever heard in your life. Especially as the studio did not want electro dance. I'm glad they did keep it to this because it worked in this film brilliantly. It set up a sequel. It did everything brilliantly. Is there anything wrong? Well, I'm nitpicking this week. Because there's not actually much wrong with the film itself. The story is brilliant. The acting is brilliant. The cinematography with what they had to work with was beautiful. Just the special effects. I mean, the creature effects are appalling as well. Goro did not look that good. But it's still a fun, enjoyable film. The one I would recommend to anybody. So what am I going to rank it? You know what? I can't hate this film. Really can't. But I'm not going to give it a 10. I'm actually going to give it an 8. 8 out of 10 berries is my ranking. But that's my thoughts, that's my opinions. What did you think? Did you enjoy this film? Even though it had the lack of gall which it should have had. What do you think about this film? Let me know in the comments below. Next week we're going to do, talk about a film that's about to be remake, released as a remake over the Christmas period. But I'm not doing the video over Christmas period because I'm only going to do Christmas films over Christmas. Dusty! Any guesses, leave them in the comments below. It's a tough uh, it's a tough clue this week. But other than that, if you like the video, please hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, and also please share on social networking as well. And I'll look forward to seeing you next Sunday. Take care. Bye-bye. Dusty! Steve.